Let's just open in prayer. I want to pray this prayer over you. Please listen to what's being prayed. This is something you want to pray over your children. This is something you want to pray over children that haven't even been born yet. You can lay a foundation of prayer for your children or grandchildren that have not been born. This is over everyone in this room. This is Colossians 1, 9 through 14. And we will address this a little bit in the end of this prayer later in the sermon, but if you could just agree with me, this is the word, this is what Christians should be praying for themselves, Colossians, it's a a letter to the church, and so as we begin today, I I do not cease to pray, that means he always prayed this, making mention of you in my prayers, that means he mentioned you, asking that you would be filled with the full, deep, and clear knowledge of your will. You and your children and your grandchildren, all unborn, and all spiritual wisdom, comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of you, and an understanding and discernment of spiritual things. May we walk and live and conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of you, fully pleasing you, and desiring to please you in all things, bearing fruit in every good work, steadily growing and increasing in and by the knowledge of you. This is about relationship with a fuller and deeper and clearer insight, acquaintance, and recognition into you. I pray we would be invigorated today and strengthen with all power according to the might of your glory to exercise every kind of endurance and patience and perseverance and do it with joy. Thank you, Father, for qualifying us that says you're qualified for the blessings and making us fit to share the inheritance. Those are your blessings of the saints, God's holy people in the light. Thank you for delivering us and drawing us to yourself out of the control and dominion of darkness and translating us into the kingdom of the son of your love. Keywords, in whom we have redemption through his blood, which means forgiveness of sins. Isn't that interesting that one of the top four prayers in the New Testament, Paul probably would have told you that. He wrote probably three out of the four, ends with, you better remember the forgiveness of sins at the end of the prayer. And so I do have to say something. I, I, I don't know if I would even call it a correction. I may have confused some people or last week or maybe possibly cross-plowed my father a little bit, so we, we watch that, you know, we, we try not to, uh, we pay attention to what each other's saying, and he never called me on this, but we went over to scripture, uh, eight, Romans 8, 32, he who did not withhold or spare his own son, the only son he had, but gave him up for us all, will he not with him, that's with Jesus, freely and graciously give us all other things. And we were talking about blessing. We were talking about healing. And, and what I, I, I don't want to mislead you. Last week we were talking about that, how it doesn't cost you anything. And I will preach that until the end. You just read it. It's free, right? Healing costs you nothing. I think if you've, if you've got to obey everything God tells you to obey for you to be healed, like I've heard a lot of preachers preach, Well, that's no different than Israelites walking through the desert under the law, under a whole nother covenant. But in regards to finances, I do believe that you can prosper without tithing because I see it. But I will tell you this, tithing is a really true act of faith that I believe in the American culture, sorry for the confession, may never get will always have problems with the acceptance in the American body of Christ. They look to use the words like generosity. You know, they change it. Generosity. I'll tell you this. I believe with all my heart, you will be far more prosperous if you tithe because God is a rewarder. God is a rewarder. Will he take care of you? Absolutely. This, this, I believe God will take care of you, but I believe in tithing. I believe... Unfortunately, hopefully, this is not this church, but for the body of Christ in America, this is something that's it's special and that God will reward because he is a rewarder. And it's almost like put it across, but sometimes it's put across if, if you pay God, you know, like, like an investment. You got to pay him, right? And if, if we could look at the sculpture that you're so familiar with, if we could throw that up, I believe 
this is what gives you your protection. And that, that's, so you're dropping that in the offering bucket as a form of worship. This is what gives you your protection. I will all believe, always believe in the tithe myself, and I will always give over 10, over 10% well over, but you are welcome here if you don't. Uh, there's a church in, church in Singapore with 30,000 people, 80% tithing rate, which is, you know, the American church right now, what, it's 10%, 20%. Other cultures, a lot of times, you don't even hear offering messages, especially the a Asian culture. Well, that particular church in 2009 had 15,000 people, and they had 25 millionaires, and I can tell you they did not start with 25 millionaires. It's because those people dropped the tithe in the bucket. You don't even hear anything about it. I'm saying they're better than us? No. I just have to say they have a better understanding of it, and it doesn't need to be talked about, it just gets done. Again, we're talking about two different cultures. Remember, our culture was born on, they, the British tried to tax us, we threw all their tea in, in the ocean and said, come get us. We're not paying your taxes. So we are born, you know, kind of out of rebellion, in a way. And so, I wouldn't call this a correction. The Lord spoke to me during the offering, and I, you know, because I just sit there, it goes in direct deposit for me. Because I know if I don't direct deposit it, you know, it may not get there. And so I'm kind of checked out, and he's like, you give. This is a form of worship just as strong as the worship you just went through. I'll just say this about the tithe. If, if, if you get your mindset out of giving to get and into a form of worshiping God with your first fruits, and as, as I say... You are welcome here if you don't give anything. And really the Bible says if you can't give it gladly, right? right you, you, you should contemplate giving it at all. And so there's no pressure being put on you to give anything. But we'll always teach what's in the Bible and tithing is in the New Testament. And before I, I just want to run through this here. Let's see. Acts 14.8. I'm going to start highlighting these stories we, we paraphrased it last week. It said, uh, there was a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb. He had never walked in his life. He was listening to Paul preach. Listening to him preach and beholding him, Paul, verse 9, saw him in the crowd, perceived that he could get his healing, and said, stand upright in your feet. And the man who had never walked in his life leaped. He leaped. I can't, I'm not, Dad did give me the call and told me not to go down here anymore. So I can't even, anyway, so. So listen to this now. The guy was just preaching and he got healed. These are non-Christians. No one had Jesus in their heart. How do we, how do we see this? Uh, verse 11, and when the people saw that, what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying the speech of Lyconia. That was a, 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 a Greek state at the time. The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men, and they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury because he was the chief speaker. Those are their Greek gods. So they were not Christians, but yet they received it just from speech, no, we just read that the gospel was being preached as Paul was preaching, a man who had never walked in his life jumped. I mean, usually in this day and age, okay, ma'am, get up. Can you get up? Do you have faith to stand on your feet, man? Come on, man. You know how that goes. And then he takes up. This guy just jumped. Jumped. Never taken a step in his life. And these were all non-Christians, so please today, Understand that something can happen to you. Something can happen to you. And not just healing a word of wisdom about your future, a word of knowledge about what you need to know, maybe about your business or one of your children in the present, maybe the discerning of spirits, any uh, gifts of the spirit. He has, he has nine gifts. They're free. That, that word gift is charis, grace, free, costs nothing. But you have to know that you can have it. Sitting in your seat, just halfway listening, okay? Maybe in the middle of a nap. You can still get it. And two weeks ago, we started 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. 
the New English Standard got the Greek right. If you study it, it says, I deliver to you as of first importance. You have to pay attention when the Bible starts giving you orders and numbers and orders of things. You have to look at that. What, what, what's first importance? That Christ died for your sins. And then it says, and then it goes on about the death, burial, and resurrection. So what we just heard, the number one thing in the New Testament, first importance is the forgiveness of sins, the death, burial, and resurrection. I can remember Joseph Prince doing a series years ago. Every time Jesus said the word first, first, years ago, he actually talked about how Jesus said, first, take care of the kids. Take care of the kids. First. I think your church is taking care of the kids. And the souls will follow. You have to pay attention to numbers and orders in the Bible. I would, I would think that if you're sick in your body and you want healing, the Bible might be hinting to you to focus on the forgiveness of sins and the death, burial, and resurrection, just like the verse says. If you're always lacking in life, always coming up short, if you need a touch from God, if you don't understand the extent of your forgiveness, you're going to have trouble walking and receiving the blessings. Another minor mistake from two weeks ago, but it really helps me today. It fits. I was paraphrasing. I've been paraphrasing these, these Jesus stories, healing. We looked at Luke 5, 17. Last week, it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law, all preachers, sitting by, which were come out of every town, and the power of the Lord was present to heal every single one of them while he was teaching. Notice that it was, it was for all these guys. Now, this was in Peter's house. If you ever go to Israel, you can see that where this happened. You can see where this man was lowered through the roof. You will stand there and look at it. And they were able to prove it. And so this was going on in Peter's house. His, his house must have been packed. And, and the power of the Lord wasn't just there to heal one person, but it just, ha- it just healed one. It was, it was there to heal them all. And, but je- check out how Jesus heals this guy, what he says. You know, they, they drop him through, the, they, they put a hole in the ceiling, drop him in uh, on, a, on a bed or some type of gurney, and... Jesus is noticing this. Let's just read verse 19. When they could not find by, by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop, let him down through the tiling with his couch in the midst before Jesus. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. Oh, okay. And the scribes and Pharisees, they began to question him. They're like, well, he, he has this, that's blasphemy. He can't do that, that's blasphemy. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, what reason ye in your hearts? Verse 23, isn't it easier to say thy sins be forgiven or to say rise up and walk? Interesting. But the, then he says, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick man, I will say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch, go into thine house. The man rose up, picked up his couch, and ran out of there. So did Jesus lay hands on him? Did he say, be healed? He said, your sins are forgiven. And the preachers questioned that. This guy was the only person of all those people and the preachers of the law these guys had the Old Testament memorized. In order to be an official Pharisee, you had to have the, at least the Pentateuch memorized. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Word for word. Yet in a very similar situation with the woman that washed her feet, his feet with, his, with her hair and poured $30,000 worth of oil on him. That was a Pharisee's house, and Jesus told them in so many words, she knows how much she's forgiven. She knows. 
And she's the only one that got touched. You don't know how much you've been forgiven. Paraphrasing those words again, if you think you have to be forgiven much, you receive a lot more than if you think you really don't have to be forgiven for much. So we're talking about the forgiveness of sins. And, there's, and if there's no forgiveness of sins, past, present, future, or complete forgiveness of sins, past, present, future, then we might as well just be doing animal sacrifices up here. Because his death means nothing. They, get, they, they were able to cover themselves in the old covenant. Their sins were covered under the old covenant with animal sacrifices. And so Romans 8, 1 and 2, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ. You see the second half of that verse? You should just erase it. You know why? Because he didn't write it. He didn't write that. The translators added that. And if, if you have a good Bible, it'll be italicized. That means that wasn't written originally. They can't wrap their head around the fact that there's no condemnation in Jesus. So they want to go on and say, no, you, gotta, you can't walk in the flesh. You have to walk after the Spirit. Okay? They added that. There's no condemnation in Jesus. What I'm trying to tell you is if you're hearing preaching that causes you to be condemned Jesus Christ isn't in it. And you remember that. Jesus Christ is not in it. And once you're not condemned, verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus will make you free from the law of sin and death. Verse 2, if you're under condemnation, if you're walking in shame for anything, if you have not come to the point where you realize how much God has really forgiven you, let's look at Romans 5, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, you're justified by faith. You're justified by faith. That means not guilty, that word. Not guilty because you believe. That's what that means. You're not guilty because you believe you're righteous in God's eyes. You have peace with God in all situations. That means you shouldn't have anything but peace with God. You may not have peace with man, but you will have peace with God in every situation, or he wouldn't say it. I'm trying to convince you through the cross, the forgiveness of sins, the death, burial, and resurrection, that you are at peace with God no matter what, because he's declared you not guilty. Many Bible scholars believe any time you see the words justified or righteousness in the New Testament, you just write in, clearance from all guilt. Because that's what he did on the cross. So if you have condemnation or shame, you are cutting short the six hours that he spent on the cross as a beaten piece of meat. He had said he was mauled and unrecognizable. Let's show that again, the sculpture. And that's not even... Huh. It says he could see his bones... It was prophesied that he could see his bones. Can I take you guys back to Luke 5, 17? I want to focus on Luke 23 and 24 again. Listen, Luke 5, 23 and 24. He said, is it easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or rise up and walk? Then he says, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. So he says to the man that's paralyzed, thy sins are forgiven. I think Jesus should have said something else. It was more proper, more logical for him to say, you know that I have power to heal the sick. Rise and walk. But he didn't say that. He said, you know that I have power to forgive sins. Now rise and walk. He did not say I have power to heal the sick. He said, I have power to forgive sins. And do you know what that means if you really break that down? Whether you receive the forgiveness of sins, whether if you really believe you're forgiven of all your sins will determine whether you receive what you're believing for. Why wouldn't he said, I just want to let you know I have power to heal you right now. No, I forgive you of your sins. Rise up and walk. Hint, hint. One of the major reasons people are not healed in this day and age, this dispensation of grace, is they have forgotten what the Bible considers the most important thing. How do we know? Because we just read it. 
We just read it. Is forgiveness of sins. And, or they have never known how forgiven they were. Or maybe they've been preached like it was been preached to many people during the 80s. Partial forgiveness. Partially. The church, in my opinion, as a whole, the body of Christ as in America, has paid dearly with preachers preaching partial forgiveness, i.e. broken fellowship with God when you sin. I've heard it preached myself hundreds of times through the 80s, how you have partial forgiveness. I heard things like, God forgives your sins from the day you're born until the day you receive Jesus, okay? They used to tell you, they still tell you. All your sins are forgiven from the day you were born until the day you ask him into your heart. Every day after that, you gotta deal with it. We don't tell people they're forgiven for their entire lives. That's half the reason the body of Christ is walking in oppression, depression, shame, and condemnation. I'm talking about new covenant Christianity, New Testament Christianity. This, the end of this prayer that I opened with, Colossians 1, 12 through 14, this is the last three verses out of the Amplified. Giving thanks to the Father, so he has you in a prayer giving thanks. Why? Because he's qualified. You're qualified. Right now, you're qualified. You're already qualified. Qualified for what? For the inheritance. So you're reading it. That's the blessings. It's not just heaven. It's prosperity. It's healing. It's the gifts of the Spirit. You're qualified right now. It says, verse 13, the Father has delivered and drawn us to himself out of the control and dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of our sins. Forgiveness of our sins. It says we have the forgiveness of sins, plural. We're not trying to get that. You already have that. Colossians 2.13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you. What? All. All. If you were only forgiven up to the point that you got saved, it wouldn't say all. It wouldn't say forgiven past tense, as in already done. It wouldn't say, it, it, it wouldn't say past tense, and it wouldn't say all trespasses. Let's see. Okay, let's look at that in Amplified. You who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, your sensuality, your sinful carnal nature, God brought to life together with Christ, having freely cost you nothing, forgiven us all, all. That means all, okay? Let me explain this, though. Where does it go right after this on forgiveness? It says, verse 14, it canceled, blotted out, wiped away the handwriting of the note bond with its legal decrees and demands, which was in force and stood against us, and it was hostile towards us. What is that? Does anyone know what that is? That's the Ten Commandments. And what did he do with it? This note with its regulations, decrees, and demands, set it aside, cleared completely out of our way, and nailed it to the cross. And then it says, he disarmed principalities and powers. Those are demons. What did he disarm them of? Well, what did you say? The law. They can't use the law against you. That is why Galatians was written. So that you could, under Jesus Christ, being a Christian, you would not fall under the curse of the law, which is possible. And so, have it, does that, did it say, forgiving us all our transgressions? Does that mean 90%? That covers your entire life. There's so many scriptures I can point to. Where it's saying the same thing. You know, human reasoning says when you hear this kind of preaching, you're going to go out, head downtown to the chalet, 
That was there in the 80s. I wonder if the chalet is still there and drink three pitchers of beer and get a DWI driving home. That is man's reasoning, and that's why people, in my opinion, are afraid to preach this. Because we've been taught for so long, every time you sin, he snatches that righteousness away, and you have to turn around and confess it right now. Or you're out of, uh, uh, you, you get that partial forgiveness. You, you're you're bro- in broken fellowship when you worry, when you fear, anytime you doubt, anything that's not out of faith, done out of faith is a sin. You better be confessing all day long. Okay? The Bible calls anything not done out of faith is a sin. This is a sin right here. Hey, let me give you an example. Hey, Jim, how many did you guys win by the other night? Uh, we won by 13. We really won by 11. An exaggeration is no different than an addict shooting heroin into their arm. It's all a sin. There's no sin scale. You can, you can show me the sin scale. God never give, has, doesn't have a sin scale like the church has. Get better sins, worse sins. It's all a sin. And so... If you, you, you should always judge what's being preached to you. Always judge what's being preached to you. And then prove it in the word. But in my opinion, if you're judging other people, it's a sin. Outside of that, you should judge yourself. Judging other people. Ugh. I hate it when I see living more people going after somebody. You know, on, on whatever, social media. It's just like Jesus said, you judge and you'll be judged. Under the law. It, we have a right to judge that. Really, how about just pray for him? Amen. How about just pray for him? You can sin just thinking about a thought too long. I do believe you confess your sins, and we'll end it with that. That word in 1 John 1, 9 means agree. Agree with God. But that is not so you can get back into his righteousness. That is not because you have broken fellowship. That is not why you agree with God on your sins. That's actually so you can receive mercy and grace and blessing at the throne of grace when you confess your sins, and you don't have to do it all day every day. Why is it a waste of time to do it all day every day? Hebrews 8, 12, I'll be merciful and gracious toward their sins. I'll remember their deeds of unrighteousness no more. So once you give them to him, he doesn't remember. So if you've got shame over the matter and you're concerned with your relationship with God, you are, you are, you are technically trampling on the six hours that he spent on that cross. In the end, you do not have to worry about people being spoiled in their actions by the magnitude of God's forgiveness because what did he tell the lady that, that, he, that washed his feet with her hair and was the most sinful one in the room and the only one that got touched that day? He said, those who know they're forgiven much will love God much. Those who think they're forgiven little think they need to be forgiven little. Those who think they might sin only three times a day will love God little. Remember, they were all Pharisees he was talking to. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Way ahead. Way ahead. 30 minutes? We've been going 30 minutes? Okay. Look at the electricity in here. It is a form of power, is it not? All electricity, the lights and the sound and, you know, we, dishwashers. Um, I remember we went three years without a dishwasher. <sighs> wow. Okay. <laughs> without electricity, where would we be? It's, it's a phenomenon of the last century and a half. Thomas Edison discovered the light bulb in 1879. Ben Franklin did the key with the kite thing. And the lightning in 1752. Think about uh, the times of Napoleon Bonaparte, Alexander the Great, 13th, 14th, 12th century, all that, Julius Caesar, and the Romans who actually brought the world to another level with their technology, their road building, their ability to move water for miles. 
They change the world. But do you know at any given time in the history of mankind, man could have harnessed that power of electricity? It was always there. It was always there. The Vikings used to live by the great waterfalls in Europe. They lived in caves and they lived in little huts around the waterfalls. They lit their houses with torches and flames and, or, or, or burned oil. And you know, those great waterfalls could have generated maximum electricity for all of them. So electricity, you could say, with the coming of the light bulb, was released upon the earth. But yet all the way back to Roman times, even the power was always there to harness. Always. It was always there. It could have been harnessed. Why didn't it happen? There wasn't the wisdom there wasn't the knowledge. There was no understanding that had been released by God at that point. We're talking about things based on certain periods of time. Electricity is a form of power being released by God for man to receive. But the potential was always there. <laughs> Luke five seventeen. read the last sentence. And the power of the Lord was present. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. The potential is always here. And you know, you've got electricity so common, you can cool a room with it, you can heat, heat a home, even if it's 25 below for two straight weeks, you can heat a home. You know, there was a time when every single one of us lived without a mobile phone, and we didn't know how good we had it. Today you see a commotion of a guy and in the, in the, in the, in, say Starbucks in the corner, pitching a fit, and you realize he left his mobile phone at home. All truths are parallel here. There will come a time when the body, and I think it is very soon because this is the end times, when the body of Christ will learn how to receive or even take the power that is available to you. We're talking about the power of God, the type of power we see in Acts, Gospels, um, and the Old Testament. I would love for a raven to bring me food. I saw a raven in the parking lot the other day. It was Friday morning, and I, I spoke to it, and it told me to bring that thing it was eating over here. And it didn't come. <laughs> but why not? He, he, he came and fed a guy that didn't even have Jesus in him, didn't have God in him. I believe there will be a day in these last days when those who are not healed will be in the minority. Do you, do you want your, how, how come you don't have your healing? How come you don't have electricity? You have kerosene landers in your house. How come you don't have electricity? When God says to you, hear my word, hear my word, hear my word, what happens? Hearing, hearing, and hearing. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing. Let's translate the word of Christ. There's an order, and you have to hear first, then faith comes. Wow, I feel like I missed something, you guys. 2 Peter 1. This has gone too fast. This felt like five minutes. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. May grace, God's favor, peace, which is perfect, well-being. When was the last time you had perfect well-being for even a whole day? Raise your hand if you have. You can be totally honest. Nobody's going to look at you like, oh, well, look at him. Good. We got two. Okay. You can have it, right? You can have that, that perfect well-being, all spiritual prosperity, freedom from any fear. Things scare me three times a day. Agitating passions and moral conflicts. But look at this. This is multiplied. This stuff can be multiplied, this grace and peace. But do you get any of it? If what I'm saying is bothering you, I contend you get very little. It can be multiplied times 100. Favor you don't deserve. This is how you receive grace, getting knowledge of the Father in Jesus Christ. What does it say? You grace and peace be multiplied through the righteousness of our God, not yours, not yours, and our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ, excuse me, through the knowledge of God. And Jesus. So you get, have you heard about Jesus today? Have you heard about God? Do you, see, but you have to understand, I can get grace right now. I can get grace I, knew, I do not deserve. 
There's a scripture. Um, here it is. Notice he says, second, we're, we're going to, I'm getting ahead of myself. Listen now, verse five in 2 Peter 1. All this, let's go through the King James. I've been doing it. I've given you every translation possible, right, in these things. It says, beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. This is all in the same set of scriptures. Virtue means moral character. And to virtue, knowledge, which means you can add intelligence to your faith, right? Next, next verse. To knowledge, temperance. That means self-control. That means self-restraint. That means not doing 88 all the time out there on 94. Patience, temperance, to, pati to, to patience, godliness. That's devotion to God. These things are all, some of them are fruits of the Spirit, things that you really want to operate in. And, and to that, brotherly kindness. And then brotherly kindness, charity, which is Christian love. Christian love. And notice it says in verse 8, for as these qualities are yours and increasingly abound in you, if you can do them, if you can do them, they will keep you from being idle and unfruitful. Unto the personal, they will keep you from being idle and unfruitful when you get that knowledge of Jesus. If you can do them. Well, I, can I just be honest? I'm like three for eight on those. You just go regular basis kind of thing. Three for eight. So he's talking in verse nine to me, whoever lacks these qualities in some way is blind, short-sighted, seeing what is only near to him. And then it tells you why you can't, you don't, it gives you the reason. You don't have self-control, um, moral integrity, self-restraint, patience, godly devotion, brotherly kindness, or brotherly love. Because he, what does it say? You've forgotten that you were purged from your old sins in some way. What that says is somewhere you have condemnation or shame. And so if you, you have cut your, you, have, you do not have faith that you are the righteousness of God right there for that situation. So what happens is you can't walk in those fruits and, and, and because in some way you have forgotten somewhere, somehow, or just don't know how much you've been forgiven. That's the reason. That's the reason it gives. So if we could just close today, I want to say a prayer, but I want to take you through the scripture first, all right? You're talking about confession of sin, Hebrews 4.16 He's writing to Christians, and what does he say? You can come to God fearlessly. You come confidently. You don't, you don't come shamed. You don't come, you don't come shamed and boldly. And, then, and you draw near to what? The throne of judgment? The throne of grace. The throne of grace, what is that? That's a throne of where you get, where you get good things that you don't deserve. Why? Because it's God's unmerited favor to sinners. Yeah, it just called you a sinner. People get offended at that. Well, Paul said he was the chiefest of all sinners. Read Romans 7 sometime. We'll hit that next week, a little bit of that. Why, why, why? We go to the throne of grace for what? What do we do? That you can receive mercy for what? Your failures. So when you do fail, you go and you agree with him to get mercy. What's mercy? Not getting the bad things that you have coming to you. So you go to God, you, you agree with him, yes, but I want, I'm, I'm receiving mercy, receive mercy and find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help, well-timed help coming just when you need it. That means it can take a little time, okay? And so it's telling you what to do in order for, to, to deal with your sin. Do you have to do it all day, every day? No, but you have to understand, see, this is what people can, you, work and school and education, they're not gonna give you something you don't deserve, right? A lot of times, parents don't even give you something you don't deserve. That's not how we are. 
So it's so hard to wrap your head around that, isn't it? You go to God for your, for your sins and he says, I'm, all, I'm, all, I'm not only gonna give you mercy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you favor you don't deserve just for connecting with me. And so, can we just, can we do this together? I, I don't think I've ever done this. You're, what we're doing is we're exercising our forgiveness all together. That's what we're about to do. We're about to close exercising our forgiveness all together. And I'm just going to stand up here and I'm going to list every sin I can think of, right? And if there's something I don't list, put it up there to him. Put it up there to him. And what are we asking for? Not getting the bad things that we have coming to us because we're agreeing, okay, Lord, right? Or, and blessing that we don't deserve just because you brought it to him and you understand what you, that he can turn. That's, that's what, what the verse where sin increases and abounds. God's grace increases the more and super abounds. That's what that means. But you have to, you have to know that you can have it. And you have to know that, that, that you're not separated from him when you make a mistake. Sin, the word sin means miss the mark. When you miss the mark, he doesn't turn his, you don't have an umbrella protection he takes off of you. So can we just agree? Can we agree? Here we go. Father, we come to you right now. We come to the throne of grace. And we just receive mercy for all of it, Lord. Fear, worry, doubt, unbelief, slander, gossip, fault finding, pride, any kind of pride, Lord. Any kind of pride, any kind of deceit, any kind of lies, any kind of wrong thought patterns. patterns. Oh, oh the, big, the big sins at the top of the scale, uh, drinking, smoking, chewing, drugs, all of it, Lord. Pornography. All the sins of the flesh, Lord. Sins of omission, sins of commission, we simply give them to you. We give them to you. And we receive mercy. And we find grace in abundance. Because you said it, where sin increases in abounds, your grace increases the more. And super abounds. So you work that, Lord. We put it on you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming to church. Listen, I'm excited about next week, the 4th of July, because, um, you know, I'm a holiday guy here, right? And, and the 4th of July, I want to take you through what really being redeemed from the curse means, all right? And I want to take you through some curse situations in the Old Testament and what the significance of him hanging on that cross all of it, it's going to be in detail, it's going to be the last, maybe the last one of this six message series, the second longest one I've ever done. <laughs>